my name is Lilligan. Physics is infamously known for being a thorn in the backside of students of all ages. And that's because it relies a lot more on the understanding of concepts rather than the memorization of information. You could have a mind palace the size of the iceberg that sank the Titanic just sat in your brain with every physics formula known to man lodged in there. Even still, if I asked you a question, maybe even at the most basic of levels, you very well still might not be able to answer that question. I think that this is a particular feeling that's quite unfamiliar to us. Like, I'm sure we've all felt loss in the sense that we just don't know the work that's in our syllabus, but in physics, even if you know all the work to a T, you can still absolutely like tank your exam. In a way, it's not really our fault. The schooling system is kind of designed in a way that favors people who can just stuff information into their brains and blurt it out onto the paper in the exam. We're used to speeding through the syllabus at the speed of light and kind of hoping something sticks and then revisiting the entire syllabus right before the exam to, to actually study and memorize it. Physics throws a fat spanner in the works, like laughing manically as our well-practiced studying techniques come to a grinding halt. And that's why I'm making this video Physics isn't really that complicated, we just lack the tools to tackle it. Whether you're studying IGTSE, AS or even maybe some university level stuff, these principles that I'll be talking about, you can apply that no matter what level you're at when it comes to physics. The first principle that I've written up when it comes to physics is consistent effort. Because physics requires a lot more understanding than just memorization, it is a subject that might take longer to get under your belt because you can't just stick information into your brain and call it a day. You can't just read the syllabus and the information for the entirety of the semester and then pull an all-nighter before the exam and just stick all the information in your brain the night before. That just won't work. You need to put in consistent effort throughout the entirety of your semester or the multiple semesters that your course cover and covers because you'll need to keep your mind sharp on the subject that you have covered and make sure to give yourself enough time to fully understand the new topics that you're learning before you just move on. And that brings me to principle number two, which is what I like to call the bottom up approach. Physics is a big subject that can be broken down into many smaller subjects that you can kind of visualize as a map. It is also kind of a building block subject, like you only know physics as well as the last concept you fully understood. That means that if you fall behind on a lower level topic, you'll be in the dark for the rest of your academic career. Because of this, you can't just be brushing over information and just moving on even if you know that you don't fully understand the work that you've been given. Rather, you want to work through the syllabus systematically using this bottom-up approach. So as I said, imagine physics as a map. The map is divided into each of the big fields of physics, so like classical physics, relativity and quantum physics. As you're learning new concepts, you're like building little towers in each area of the map or in each field. So if you're like learning about momentum, you'll be building a tower in classical physics. If you're learning about positrons, you'll be building a tower in the field of quantum mechanics. It's important to remember that each tower isn't just its own individual island. It is connected to the rest of the towers and the rest of the fields around it because it falls under the big umbrella that is physics. It's really important to keep the big picture in mind when it comes to physics. You need to slot information into pieces that you already know. This will help you get a full grasp on physics and the concepts that you are learning because you're not just like throwing a new piece of information into the void that is your brain, but rather you're categorizing the information that you're learning and keeping things neat in your head. And without that, it'll get very confusing and you'll be very lost. <laughs> I speak from experience. This bottom-up approach principle thing goes deeper than that though. Let's go back to like learning about momentum. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. If you didn't pay attention back when you were learning about what mass is and what velocity is defined as, which are two foundational building blocks, your foundation will be very bad if you wanna go stick momentum on top of that tower. In fact, 
if you're really in the dark about mass and velocity, for example, your entire tower might collapse if you try to stick momentum on top of it. Even if you've memorized P is equal to MV, you still don't understand what it means because you don't have that foundation, that bottom up idea of what the heck the book is even talking about. The bottom up approach is really great because it forces you to apply principle number one, which is consistent effort because you can't only start putting in effort halfway through the syllabus because then all your foundational building blocks will be very weak and iffy and all your towers will start falling over and you'll be really stressed before your exam as you're trying to learn new concepts that you need to know if you want to be able to actually pass your exam bottom up boys <laughs> the next principle principle number three is understand where the equations come from as i said before you can memorize p equals mv until your like face turns blue but like if i asked you what does that mean and you can't give me an answer knowing the equation is literally useless <laughs> this is a principle that a shocking amount of students throw to the wind memorization does not equal understanding if you don't understand what an equation means, what the variables represent, and how they relate to one another, you won't be able to apply that equation to out-of-the-box questions in your exam. If you do take the time to understand what each variable means, it'll be much easier to remember the equation anyway because it's not just something you're reciting like a parrot, it's something that you've actually internalized and understand. Don't be lazy. <laughs> take the time put in the effort and you will reap the results. All right, next up, principle number four. Go slower to understand faster. Physics, mm, that's a car. As I've mentioned a lot in this video, physics requires the internalization of concepts. In school, we're often under immense time pressure when it comes to needing to learn and understand the information in the syllabus. There's really, rarely enough time to sit down and study a topic exhaustively before we move on. It's more of a sprint than a marathon in school and things learned in this fashion rarely stick, especially long term. Now, there's not much you can do about the time allocated to you if you're in school, though you can still try to apply this principle the best you can and I would highly recommend you still do that. But if you're a homeschooler, you can really try and build your entire timetable and your schedule around this principle. You need to learn physics in small chunks. You can't just fly through a chapter and call it a day. Some concepts take longer to understand than others. It's just how it is. And you can't really predict that. And that's fine, but you just need to keep that in mind. So sit down, read the textbook, watch YouTube videos, do as many practice problems as humanly possible, and make sure that you really understand and internalize the concept. There's a pretty easy way to check whether you fully understand something before you move on, and I've mentioned this before in other videos, but if you can't explain a concept to someone in simple terms, you don't know it well enough. Using this principle will ensure that your building blocks are nice and secure in preparation for other blocks to be stacked on top of them. And speaking of time, welcome to principle number five. Stop scheduling your learning. This point ties in with the previous principle. Scheduling is something we do to alleviate stress. Most of what stress is is just fear and often the fear of the unknown. And what we're trying to do by scheduling is to make as much of the future as we possibly can known to us so we can alleviate some of that stress. The way generally we go about that is by scheduling, at least in my case, every hour of every day of every week for the next few weeks coming up to my exam so that I know exactly which page I will be doing on which day because otherwise I just completely lose my mind with stress. And I don't know if that's exactly what you do but unfortunately you just can't predict the future. And the funny thing is that this standard studying timetable often causes us even more stress in the end because what making such a strict timetable does is in an attempt to stick to this super in-depth and strict timetable that we've created, we do end up brushing over certain con concepts because you know you only have so many hours in a day and I need to finish this so that I can get to the next thing that I had planned for tomorrow. This creates a whole new area of unknowns 
i.e. the actual work that you're supposed to know off by heart. This is a really silly way to go about things. Your main focus should be understanding the work, not adhering to a timetable. Because of this, I suggest you try and implement a retroactive revision timetable, is what they call it. But honestly, you could just call it a retroactive studying timetable. This type of timetable is great compared to the standard revision timetable, because firstly, it frees up a lot of time you would have spent actually making a standard revision timetable because it's such a simple concept. And secondly, it helps you to focus on understanding rather than time spent studying. So what does this retroactive revision timetable look like? Well, it's literally just a list of all the concepts and topics covered in your syllabus. It's literally as easy as that. You use this list by logging each day that you spend covering or studying or revising this subject. This helps you keep track of how much time you are spending studying the subject, but you also keep track of your understanding of the subject by color coding each log that you put in on each day for every subject. For example, if you cover a subject on like the 7th of May and you felt a bit iffy on it, you'd write 7th of May and make that log red. And then if you then go and revise it again on the 10th of May and you felt a bit better, you could make an orange and then you could make it yellow. And finally, when you'd cover it on a day and you feel, wow, I've really got this under my belt, you make that log green. And now you know how much time you've spent, but also just more importantly, how well you understand that subject or that topic in your subject. And that way you can get a broader idea of how well you understand the subject as a whole. Also, this way you don't have to study chronologically. You can jump from momentum on one day to waves the other day. And it doesn't really matter as long as you fully understand everything by the end of the day. And if you're someone who likes being a bit more systematic about things, you can still do that. But you're still freeing up a lot of time and alleviating that pressure of having to stick to a timetable. You can use it in any way that you see fit. But focusing on understanding rather than time spent studying, as I've said, is the key here. It really does help us get rid of that full sense of security that studying for hours and hours might give us like you can study for six hours and learn nothing but you could revise for like 20 minutes and really have an intense session and understand exponentially more and that 20 minute session will always be more valuable it's about understanding not time and that brings us on to the sixth principle mathematics <laughs> math funnily enough is another subject that seems to be something that students on average don't seem to enjoy. I personally enjoy math currently, not that I always used to, so I get it. But I think a reason that a lot of students struggle with physics is because they struggle with math. Again, school really doesn't give you enough time to fully understand a subject. And math is also a building block type of subject. So if you fell behind in like third grade and you're now like in 12th grade, you're like, what are you, that must be awful. And because of that, students are terrified of the subject. And if physics is essentially just the application of math, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> like it's easy to see why a lot of students hate physics if they hate math. Since the environment that school creates really isn't very conducive to learning subjects that are building block based, such as math and physics, the only way to really flourish in the subjects is to go against the grain a bit. In my case, going against the grain was literally just leaving school and starting homeschooling, which I mean, that worked for me. I know it's not for everyone, but for you, it could be as simple as seeking extra information to supplement your schooling. What I used all the time was a website called Khan Academy, which you've probably heard of before. Their entire philosophy is exactly what I've been talking about for basically this entire video. You want to master a concept and that means having a concrete understanding of the most basic foundational concepts that constitute a topic as well as the broader ideas that tie them together. So that's great. I mean, that's literally their end goal is for you to properly understand the work, not just memorize it. And because of that, they have really great videos with like visual aids where there's a lot of writing going on. It's like a teacher speaking to you and writing on a blackboard. It feels very personable and it's easy to understand. And not just that, they also have tons of practice questions 
right at the end of whatever video you might have watched. So you can actually apply what you've learned right after you've learned it. They're great. Um, you can't do physics without math and they're a great resource to brush up on it. So I'll put a link in the description. Go check them out if you haven't already. And next up, the sixth principle, practice. Practice is really something you can't skip when it comes to physics. If physics is applying math, Practice questions is how you do that. It's how you gain understanding in what you learn. I know a lot of students who have the idea that questions are something you only think about approaching once you already have an exhaustive, concrete understanding of a concept that you've learned. And I think that's because they see getting questions wrong as a bad thing. Sure, it's not the best feeling in the world, like it's always better to get the correct answer, but it's only a bad thing if you don't go back and figure out why you got the question wrong. I know this is like kind of a cliche, but failure really is the best way to learn. If you're not getting things wrong, it means you're not learning. Doing questions should be the main way that you study physics. Literally, like you read the textbook and then you do questions. And then most of your time should be spent doing the questions, or at least a lot more time than you spend just reading and studying the content matter. Practice is everything. It's the only way to really gain an understanding on the subject. So I'll link some resources in the description specifically for Cambridge students. There's this one called Math and Physics Tutor, where they just have like, it's like so many questions that you just can go do like mindlessly, just sheets and sheets of questions uh, uh, that they categorize by subject or by topic. And that's really great and it makes it a lot easier for you. So also go check that out if you haven't heard about them already. Even if you're not a Cambridge student, you can still use it as you know a means of supplementing your learning. So go check it out. The last thing I want to talk about is active recall. Studies have shown that the studying techniques that are the most popular among students are actually the least effective when it comes to actually understanding and remembering information long term. In a study done back in 2013, students were divided into four groups and they were each given a specific study method that they used to try and memorize information. Then a week later they were brought back and they were tested on the information that they had to learn a week prior and I mean the results speak for themselves. Active recall is obviously the most effective learning technique amongst these popular learning techniques that students tend to use and that's the funny thing if you just went up to a student and was like what's your favorite studying technique their technique would probably fall into one of the other categories that aren't active recall which are obviously very clearly not as effective when it comes to your studying and that's not necessarily your fault I don't know why active recall isn't taught more broadly, especially in schools. But the fact of the matter is, if you're not using active recall, you're being objectively less effective in your studying. And we're not trying to be like, ooh, quirky. It's literally just facts. <laughs> so, I mean, if you don't even know what active recall is, don't worry. I made a whole video on it, especially for this purpose. I go through, you know, what exactly active recall is the principles behind it, the studies that back it up, and then also a few practical tips you can use and ways you can implement it into your own studying. No sweat, you're welcome. <laughs> Be before you go though, um, I'd appreciate if you hit the like button on this video. Go ahead, I know you want to. I, I refuse to give you the active recall video until you do. I'm waiting. Thank you very much. As a token of my appreciation, here's the video. Click on it. Click on it. Click on it. Okay, I'll shut up now. Thank you so much for watching. Good luck on your studying journey. Click the video though.